the first six verses tonight in <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 17. <clears throat> so let's read responsively this passage, Isaiah chapter 17, verses 1 through 6. I'll read on the first verse, if you would please join me on verse 2, and every other verse 2, down through verse number 6. The burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. The cities of Aroer are forsaken, they shall be for flocks, which shall lie down, and none shall make them afraid. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim, and the kingdom from Damascus, and the remnant of Syria. They shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. And in that day it shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin, and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. And that shall be as when the harvest man gathereth the corn, and reapeth the ears with his arm. And it shall be as he that gathereth ears in the valley of Rephaim. Yet gleaning grapes shall be left in it, as the shaking of an olive tree, two or three berries in the top of the uppermost bough, four or five in the outmost fruitful branches thereof, saith the Lord God of Israel. And Lord, tonight, again, as we look at this uh, great book of Isaiah, Lord, and the <clears throat> consequences of the nations that have, Lord, sinned and the judgment that's coming, I pray, Father, that you'd meet with us and teach us and help us to grow and use our preacher, Lord, fill him with your spirit. Meet with us, please, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. A couple of weeks ago, Brother Penn mentioned in Sunday school about the man of God, Mr. Uh, Hosea. And in that Sunday school lesson, he made some observations, which is something that you don't hear very often in today's preaching. He said that the prophet, as God's man, was one who spoke on God's behalf and told the people what God said, regardless of the subject matter. And he wouldn't back down, and he didn't stand down, but he stood up, and he, and he preached the truth. And that's the way God's man ought to do it. That's the way it's supposed to be. And any time you've got a mealy-mouthed uh, preacher or teacher that will not preach the truth of God's word, then that man is not worthy to be in the office of the preacher that he is. And I want you to keep that in mind, if you would please, because Isaiah was a man who was like James in the New Testament. He told it like it was to people like they were. And so these lessons that we learn from this are important for us. And tonight what I want to do is I want to review just a little bit. And we find here that Isaiah prophesies judgment for Moab, Damascus, and Ethiopia. And in this message, we're going to see God's pronouncement of judgment on Damascus and Ethiopia. Last week, we obviously covered Moab, and that was not a very pleasant sermon, to be honest with you. I was not in great enjoyment of that, but that's the way it was. So by way of review, if I may, and follow along with me, because we're not going to go through the line after line of scripture that we gave last week. If you are one who has signed up to receive the outlines from me week after week in your email, then you have all those references of scripture. You have all those different verses that we went through. So you have all that already. And those, by the way, those outlines are available upon request for anybody free of charge. And they basically are exactly the outline that I preach from. It's not anything new. Um, other than I may correct a grammatical error, a spelling error that I may accidentally put in, or one that I might on purpose put in, you just never know. And uh, we'll send that out after they've been reproofed and they've already been proofed already. So last week we looked at, number one, the suffering of Moab. The suffering of Moab. We found out that it's two key cities, the, key, the cities of R A R and the city of Kir, K-I-R, are going to be destroyed in one night. That was what the prophecy was. We learned secondly about that, that its women are going to be abandoned. And the illustration that he gave in this was they were going to be abandoned, they were going to be homeless, like homeless birds, like abandoned birds. And that was a terrible thing, but that's what happens when a nation falls apart. 
We can see illustration after illustration of that in our own country here and in many countries around the world where because of poor leadership and sinfulness in leadership, we find how people are abandoned and not taken care of and their, their, their lives are messed up because of the sin. We learned also that within three years, only a few of the people are going to be left alive. And so that was a very hard thing to be said. But listen to the last thing that was said about the suffering that was going to come to Moab. And the Bible taught us that lions were going to hunt down the survivors and kill them. We said of within three years, only a few people will be left alive. But then lions are going to hunt down the survivors. Not a very pleasant thing for Moab to hear. By the way, when you mention the name Moab, there's nothing good thought about it. Um, I know that there's a Moab in Utah, and there are many people that go there to visit. But it's hard for me to think of Moab, the word, the name, the place, anything, without thinking of all the negativity that comes right along with it. Now, I realize Moab is a vacation spot. It is a tourist spot. I realize that in America, but it was certainly not that in the Bible. And so... Uh, it's sort of like the name Ahab. Nobody names their children Ahab. Nobody names their daughters Jezebel. They might name a mean-spirited dog Ahab. They might name a car that doesn't run right Jezebel. But they won't name their sons and daughters those things. So keep that in mind. And Moab is one of those names that does not have, for me and probably for you as well, it does not have a positive connotation. The next thing that we learned was, uh, by way of review, was what was the sin of Moab. I mentioned a little bit ago that there are six things which the Lord doth hate, and seven are an abomination. That is found in Proverbs chapter 6. But what was the sin of Moab that angered God to the point of destruction? Uh, the land is filled with two things, arrogance and insolence. Arrogance and insolence. All these are related to pride. Amazing thing how the Lord absolutely detests and hates pride. I know that when my dad would look at me and he'd say, now son, I'm real proud of you. My dad always put an addenda on that phrase. He didn't need to because I know what he meant. He was so happy that the Lord was using me and so happy that I was serving the Lord. I realized that, but my dad would always say, now son, I'm really proud of you in a humble sort of way. He didn't need to put that on there uh, because I understood what he meant. He did not mean that I was high and lifted up and full of myself and proud in that way. No, uh, this is what the sin of Moab was, was arrogance and insolence as we read last week. The third point of review is this. There was sorrow over Moab. There was sorrow over Moab. We found that the Moabites are going to show their grief. They did that in a couple of different ways. First of all, they shaved their heads and their beards, and then they put on sackcloth. They shaved their heads and beards, and then they put on sackcloth. Now, why did they do this if they were full of arrogance and, and, all, and insolence? It's because judgment hurts no matter who you are. I think of the book of uh, of Hebrews, where the Bible says that chastisement is not pleasant for the moment. Now, it doesn't say it's not pleasant uh, for the child of God who will be remorseful for his sin. It doesn't say that. It simply says that chastisement is not pleasant, but it works the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And these people were broken over this, but it was too late for repentance. They are going to wander in the streets and they're going to weep and be heard from every home. Why? Because their hearts are broken over what's happening to them. When you look at America, there are many who say right now that America is living under the judgment hand of God. And there are many today who weep and wail and cry over the conditions that are in our country right now. You go to Los Angeles, you go to Denver, you go to New York City, and you see the homelessness and the tragedy and the drug addiction and the murders and the rape and the immorality and the, all the different things. And it, it should break the heart of every child of God. And it should break the heart of anyone who has to live in it or near it, how sad that is. If you've watched the news and seen how the sidewalks in downtown Denver and in Los Angeles and in New York are lined with tent after tent, and the streets and the sidewalks are filled with human waste 
and trash and garbage that is uncared for and the place is unkempt. It ought to break your heart rather than is it nothing to you, all you that pass by. Then the Bible says this is what they're going to do. It seems as though they would cry out to God. That's what it seems. But no, they didn't. Under the sorrow of Moab, the Bible taught us that they will cry to the gods in their temples. Gods with a small g. The false gods that they worship. But there was not going to be any help. Now, why wasn't there going to be any help? Because these false gods of sticks and stones and glass and wood uh, can't do anything but stand in a temple. They have no power to to redeem. They have no power to forgive. They have no power uh, to save at all. They cried out to them. It reminds me of the story of Elisha or the, the idol worshipers in Elijah. It reminds me how they cried out all day long to their false gods and cut themselves and prayed and, and cried aloud, but their gods did not answer. But when God's man prayed to God, God licked up the water and burnt the sacrifice and all the rest of it because God is the one who delivers. Then fourthly, by way of review, we learned about the sorrow over Moab. Oh, I already gave you that. Number four, we saw something else last week that was a blessing to me. We saw the broken heartedness of the man of God over the sin and judgment of Moab. We saw his sorrow. The reaction taught us that our hearts should break at the fall or failure of another. We're living in a very vengeful day, even for God's people, to where they, they rejoice over evil failing or falling. And listen, we ought to rejoice that they fail, but we ought not rejoice that they have fallen. They need to get saved. They need to get right. They need to do what's right is what they need to do. And so keep that in mind. When Isaiah saw the judgment, it broke his heart. It broke his heart in two. So tonight now we come to the other prophecies that are found in the book. And there's only a, it's a small little bit that is there, but I want you to follow along with me. I more than likely will not keep you very long tonight. We said at the very beginning, Isaiah prophesied judgment for Moab, Damascus, and Ethiopia. So tonight we look at Damascus and Ethiopia. And if you're one who takes notes, if you're one who writes in your Bible, I will once again encourage you to, outside the verses, put, maybe put a bracket or a line pointing to that and give it a title. So the next time you read through Isaiah, you will see its context and exactly what it's talking about. So number one in tonight's message is this. Notice the prophecies against Damascus. Notice the prophecies against Damascus. And underneath that, I have this, and this is where you'll put your bracket and your reference, that destruction will come to Damascus. Destruction will come to Damascus. And notice, first of all, the severity. That is Isaiah chapter 17, verses 1 through 6, that Brother Penn read with us a moment ago. And then we're going to jump down to verses 9 through 11. Isaiah 17, beginning in verse 1, with that context in mind about the severity of the judgment against Damascus. Keep these words in mind, the burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be uh, a ruinous heap. The cities of Orer are forsaken. Uh, they shall be for flocks which shall lie down, and none shall make them afraid. The fortress shall cease from Ephraim, and the kingdom from Damascus, and the remnant of Syria. They shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. And in that day it shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin, and the fatness of the flesh shall be shall wax lean, and it shall be as when the harvest man gathereth the corn and reapeth the ears with his arm, and it shall be as he that gathereth ears in the valley of Rephaim, uh, yet gleaning grapes shall be left in it, uh, as the shaking of an olive 
tree, two or three berries in the top of the uppermost bough, four or five in the outmost fr uh, fruitful branches uh, thereof shall the Lord God of Israel, uh, saith the Lord God of Israel. Now jump down to verses 9 through 11, along with that same severity of judgment. It says, In that day shall his strong cities be as a forsaken bough, and an uppermost branch which they left because of the children of Israel, and there shall be desolation because, they, because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation and hast not been mindful of the rock of the strength thereof, of thy strength therefore shalt thou plant pleasant plants and shalt set it with strange uh, uh, slips. In the day shalt thou make thy plant to grow, and in the morning shalt thou make thy seed to flourish, but the harvest shall be a heap in the day of grief and of desperate sorrow. And we find here that these nations that have forsaken God, these nations that have turned their back, as you notice, the God of their salvation, first, both of these nations are going to be punished for their terrible idolatry, their terrible idolatry. Is it any wonder that even in the Ten Commandments, God says, thou shalt have no other gods before me? Now, I know today there are many in America that do not worship or bow down to any of these false gods. I realize that. But somebody taught me years ago, and it might have been my pastor, I don't remember, it could have been my youth director, said, uh, an idol is anything that comes between me and the Lord. And today, that could be just about anything, from money to possessions uh, to relationships and all the rest of it. When anything comes between you and your God, anything, that becomes a God to you. Now, that doesn't mean you necessarily bow down to it. But if, for example, let's say that money becomes a God to you. There are those who work extra and miss church and service for the Lord simply so they can make more money. There are others who have to work second shifts and third shifts and second and third jobs in order to make ends meet. That's different. But when you've got someone who just misses God's opportunities in their lives in order to make a buck, that becomes an idol in their lives. God hates idolatry. He wants to be first. That's why the Bible says in Matthew 6 and verse 33, you remember what it says? But seek ye what? First, the kingdom of God. And his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. And what was he talking about? He was talking about food and clothing and shelter. And he said, the birds have all these things. He says, but you need to seek God and his righteousness first. And you'll never see yourself forsaken by God. And I believe that's true. Now, uh, from that, I want you to notice, as we looked at the severity of the judgment, Underneath that, I want you to notice the salvation that God offers. This is wonderful about the Lord. Chapter 17, verses 7 and 8, and then we're going to look at a few more verses in chapter 17. The salvation that God offered us says, At that day shall a man look to his maker. Now look in your Bible. That word maker has not got a small M, does it? It has a capital M. So it's talking about the Lord God of heaven. And in that day, all, at that day shall a man look to his maker, and his eyes shall have respect to, now look at the next words, Holy One of Israel, capital H, capital O. That's on purpose. So we're talking here about the Lord God of heaven. And it shall not look to, and he shall not look to the altars, the work of his hands, neither shall respect uh, that which his fingers have made, either the groves or the images. Now, look down to verse 12, beginning in verse 12, reading through verse 14. Woe to the multitude of, the many, peop of many people, which make a noise like the noise of sea the seas, and to the rushing of nations, uh, that make a rushing like a rushing of mighty waters. The nations shall rush like the rushing of, mighty wa of many waters, but God shall rebuke them, and they shall flee far off, and shall be chased as... Uh, the chaff of the mountains before the wind, and like a rolling thing before the whirlwind, and behold, at evening, evening tide trouble, and before the morning he is not. 
This is the portion of them that spoil us and the lot of them that rob us. But you notice the first part of that in verses 7 and 8 about how God's salvation is to this nation. You see, God doesn't throw the baby out with a dirty diaper. He doesn't roll the Rolls Royce over the, over the cliff because it's got a dirty ashtray. God's in the business of not being willing that anyone should perish. Yes, he will judge sin. Yes, he will punish sin. Yes, there will be chastisement. Yes, but God wants them redeemed. He wants them saved. And so finally, we find that one nation, that's Israel, it's going to turn to God and be delivered. And that's exactly what Hebrews teaches us. It teaches us very, very plainly that the chastisement that God gives to his people is not just to punish them and to make them feel badly, but it's to change them and to cause them to turn back to God. And that's what he's promising here. Then, that was the part about the destruction and the prophecies against Damascus. And now I want you to notice the prophecies against Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Ethiopia is mentioned in the Bible a number of times. They have a different name uh, many times. They're called the Cushites. And so they're very dark-skinned people, very shiny skin. And what was true then is true now when you talk about Ethiopia and the Ethiopian people. So notice, number one, destruction is going to come to Ethiopia. And underneath that, you can put Ethiopia was a strong nation. Ethiopia was a strong nation, chapter 18. You have your Bible there. Go to chapter 18, beginning in verse 1, and you can mark verses 1 through 4 about Ethiopia, the strong nation. And it says, Woe to the land shadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, that sendeth ambassadors by the sea, even in vessels of bulrushes upon the water, saying, Go, ye swift messengers, uh, to a nation scattered and peeled to a people terrible in, uh, from their beginning, uh, hitherto a nation meted out and trodden down see ye when he lifteth up an ensign on the mountains and when he bloweth a trumpet hear ye for so the Lord saith unto me I will take my rest and I will consider in my dwelling place like a clear heat upon herbs and like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. And what we find here about Ethiopia first and foremost is that it is feared far and wide for its mighty power to destroy other nations. It's feared because it was a strong nation, you see, and had everything humanly possible that could make it strong. But then I want you to notice this, if you would please. Ethiopia not only was a strong nation, but Ethiopia became a stricken nation. Verses 5 and 6 of chapter 18, it says, For afore the harvest, when the bud is perfect, and the sour grape is ripening in the flower, he shall both cut off the sprigs uh, with pruning hooks, and take away and cut down the branches, they shall be left together under the fowls of the mountains and to the beasts of the earth, and the fowls shall sell summer upon them, and all the beasts of the earth shall winter upon them. God himself is going to cut down Ethiopian armies as a man, like a man would prune a vineyard. God's going to prune them back. God hates arrogance, and God hates insolence, and God hates pride. And this strong nation was filled with both. And so we find here that God himself is going to cut them down. And even as they plan to destroy Jerusalem, God's going to cut them down before they can even do that. He doesn't let it happen. My guess is there were some people in Jerusalem, even though the God's people had sinned against God, I'm sure there was a remnant in there that was praying for God's help. And I'm sure that God was answering their prayer. And here's what happened then with Ethiopia. Terrible things that we've just read are going to be happening. God's going to cut them down like a man would trim back a vineyard. Like he would uh, take uh, his pruning hooks and pruning shears and go and trim things back. And he would do it. But I want you to notice now Ethiopia, a nation that was saved. And I don't mean born again. I mean a nation that was, de a nation that was delivered. Look at verse 7 if you would. It says, in that time shall the present be brought unto the Lord of hosts. Who's going to give God a present? 
that's interesting, of a people scattered and peeled, and from a people terrible from their beginning hitherto, a nation meted out and trodden underfoot, whose land the rivers have spoiled to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, the Mount Zion. This is a promise for future restoration for Ethiopia. There's a couple of phrases in here that I want you to see. And notice this talks about uh, the present that was given to God. Very interesting. And it talks about a people that were scattered and peeled. What in the world would God be talking about, scattered and peeled? He's talking about the way the people look. And he's describing the Ethiopian people. He's talking about a people that are tall and dark-skinned. And the, the peeled there, as I studied it, it refers to the deepness, blackness, and shininess of their skin. And so he says here, uh, In that time shall the present be brought unto the Lord of hosts of a people that were scattered and peeled from a people that were terrible from the beginning. So he's talking here about the restoration of them. During that glorious millennium, the people were being their gifts to the Lord in Jerusalem, and that the present is the people that will be brought to the Lord. And at this time, judgment is finished, and the Ethiopians, that is the Cushites, that have the dark skin, the one he describes them physically as having dark, shiny skin. And listen, you've seen uh, documentaries on people from Ethiopia. And you know how dark and shiny their skin is. And we say, boy, they really have black skin, don't they? That's what he's describing here. And these people are going to be brought before the Lord for their deliverance. And uh, they were tall and smooth and shiny black skin people. It's what's referred to there. I think it's interesting that God would describe these people that he's going to save. And for sin and rebellion to go unpunished, listen to this. For sin and rebellion to go unpunished, it would make God an unjust God. But for God to not forgive and restore would make God an unloving God. And God is neither unjust nor unloving. So we find here that God brings judgment upon nations. For what? For arrogance. For insolence. For pride. The sin of pride. But God then says, but I want to restore some of these folks, and he's going to do it. And we see that here in Isaiah chapter 18. And there's so much more that could be said. There's a lot of pictures that are drawn in each of these passages that we did. But notice how God said they would flourish, and they would be fruit-bearing, and they would be this. But he said, I'm going to make it to where they're not that way anymore. And God kept his word, and God does keep his word. And there's coming restoration. I'm always reminded of the restoration of Israel. I think about how the Bible says that God has set Israel aside for a little while, not forever, and didn't trade places with Christians or anything else. That's replacement theology, which is wrong on every aspect. But God is one day in his promise going to restore Israel back to a place of prominence, and that's his promise. And we don't have to worry about that not happening. But right now, you talk to the nation of, nation of Israel, and there's not really a mention of a Messiah that has already come. Now, there are many Messianic Jews, lots of Jewish people that have come to Christ and gotten saved. And I want to say tonight, thank God for that. A number of them have seen the light, and they've come to the Savior for salvation. But as a nation, the nation has not turned to Christ, not even a little bit. And so we must keep these things in mind. God will bring restoration, and God will bring forgiveness. Now, look up here, and I'm going to quit. After you look up here and I say something. When you backslide and your, your heart gets cold. And you're like I joke in the song. Say cold hearted, hard hearted, unfaithful, disloyal. After you've been through that phase in your Christian life. Aren't you thankful that when you go to the Lord for forgiveness. And you go to the Lord and honestly as a child of God repent of your sin. Aren't you glad that he takes you back. And you should be. And here we're seeing not only the judgment of God, but we are seeing the mercy of God. And how good our God is. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.